Okay, Dr. Lindy here. Today we're going to be talking about uh, muscle. And when we talk about muscle, I think it's important to just do a quick review of the three different types of muscle. Now, this should be a little bit of a review because we covered a little bit of this when we talked about tissues and we talked about epithelial tissue and connective tissue and nerve and muscle. When we covered muscle, we said there was skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. In terms of voluntary and involuntary, the only one of the three that you have voluntary control over are the muscles that attach to your skeleton. So those are skeletal muscles. You can voluntarily contract your biceps and move your arm. You can kick a ball voluntarily. But when we look at cardiac, right, which is also striated, much like skeletal, cardiac is involuntary. It's only found in the heart. We can tell by the name, cardiac. It's only found in the heart. Its primary purpose of the heart is to pump blood. It is striated. It is highly branched. We have these intercalated discs, but it's involuntary. You cannot consciously and voluntarily increase or decrease your heart rate in the same speed or manner that you can contract your biceps or blink your eyes or turn your head. Smooth muscle is what we consider visceral muscle because it's found around the viscera, around the organs, like your GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract. Uh, it's found in the trachea. It's found in the colon, the small intestine. It's around the uterus. It's around organs that you cannot consciously contract that have muscles around tubes like the trachea and the esophagus and the stomach and the small and large intestine in which those tubes can constrict or dilate. When it's around the bronchi, we call it bronchial constriction or bronchial dilation. When it's around the blood vessels, especially arteries or veins, we call it vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Okay. And when the smooth muscle around the intestines do contract, that type of muscular contraction is referred to as peristalsis or, or peristaltic contractions. That's when it moves things in the normal direction, moving it down. When someone vomits, that's reverse peristalsis. So what are some of the functions of muscle tissue? Well, muscles, when they contract, now let me go back to this word contraction because a lot of people get confused with this term contraction. When we say a muscle contracts, most people think that contraction is when a muscle shortens. And that's true, but it's not the only thing it means. It can mean when a muscle is elongating or shortening or even remaining the same length. So the term contraction really means that there's tension that's being generated within muscles. And that tension that's being generated is transmitted to tendons. And then tendons are the middleman between the muscle and the bone. Right? Ligaments go bone to bone. Tendons attach a muscle to a bone. So when the muscles contract on, and the functional unit of muscle is called a sarcomere, the sarcomere is that functional unit where we have these contractile protein filaments that can shorten and lengthen. And it transmits that to the tendon, and the tendons are somewhat inelastic it's not super elastic so it just tugs on the bone so it can produce body movement it can stabilize body positions as well and it can store and mobilize substances within the body and muscles also generate heat we know muscles generate heat because if it's cold out your body shivers if you have a fever of 102, when you want your fever to go up even higher, your muscles start shaking to generate heat and you start perspiring. This is how you push out toxins from the body. 
when you're exercising at the gym and your muscles are contracting and they generate heat, you start perspiring once again. So some of the properties of muscle tissue is that they are electrically excitable. They can, they are contractile. There's a degree of extensibility to muscles where they can extend. And there's elasticity where they can stretch out and recoil back. So these are some unique properties. Electrically excitable, we will see that there is nerve conduction that goes to muscles. And that connection between a nerve and a muscle is called the NMJ. NMJ stands for neuromuscular junction. Nerve, muscle, where they meet, neuromuscular junction. We know muscles are electrically excitable because if anyone has ever taken a muscle stim or a TENS unit with those pads and put it on muscle and you turn it on, your muscles start going into, uh, into spasms, right? They become electrically excited. Now, just before, you heard me mention that muscle contraction and that the term contraction doesn't just mean shortening, but it means that there's tension being generated. You can have tension on a muscle when it's shortening, when it's lengthening, or when it's remaining the same length. So concentric is when a muscle is shortening, eccentric is when a muscle is elongating, and isometric is when a muscle is remaining the same length. So concentric, if we were to describe it, it's where the muscle tension exceeds the resistance and the muscle shortens. So if we look at this picture here on all the way on the left where this individual is holding a book and the muscle contraction supersedes the resistance and the, and the book comes up. When the resistance supersede when the resistance supersedes the body's ability to contract the muscle it goes down but in a controlled format okay so concentric is when the muscle tension exceeds the resistance and the muscle shortens what do we mean by shortening we mean the origin and the insertion approximate each other so if we look at the biceps the biceps originate up here and they insert down here. When this forearm moves up, the origin and insertion are moving closer together. In the picture in B, when the arm goes down, the origin and insertion are moving further apart. So we'd say it's elongating. So the E in eccentric, think the E for elongation. Concentric is shortening eccentric is elongating. However, it's elongating back to its resting length, not beyond that. When you elongate a muscle, muscle past its normal anatomical limit, you tear a muscle or you tear a tendon. We strain it, okay? Also, with concentric, we call this the positive contraction or the acceleratory phase. And the eccentric is the negative contraction or the deceleration phase. So many times during weight training, some people may say, well, I'm doing negatives today, which is a very slow and controlled elongation process. Concentrics are like ballistic shortening phase. Eccentric is a slow elongation phase and you're controlling it in a slow manner, which is why it's deceleration. And these are really important, especially with rehab and rehabilitation. So many times when people have things like rounded shoulders or anterior head translation, which is real common in today's society because people are on cell phones looking forward, people are students and they're reading and they're looking down so their head comes forward. When you're driving, your arms come forward, so your shoulders round. And just through this, you know, repetitious anterior posturing, we get this roundedness and anterior head translation. So with that, 
we can use a lot of eccentrics, which is slow elongating and opening up the pecs, right? To elongate the pectoralis major, which is in a shortened position. Because what you'll learn is that the pectoralis major internally rotates the shoulder. When we say shoulder, we mean humerus. Internal and external rotation of the shoulder is with the greater tubercle as the reference point. So if the greater tubercles rotate in, which is what you get with rounded shoulders, then you want to open up and elongate the pecs. Okay, that's eccentrically elongate them. But then after the anterior muscles are opened up, you would want to concentrically strengthen and shorten the posterior muscles, which are the rhomboids and the middle fibers of the traps, which reinforces the shoulder staying posterior. And that would be the order in which one would want to do this. There is a law called reciprocal inhibition or Sherrington's law, which is this really beautiful relationship between anterior and posterior muscles or agonists and antagonists. An agonist is a primary mover that performs an action. An antagonist is doing the opposite action, which means it would have to be on the opposite side of the body. If one's a flexor, the other is an extensor. If one's a medial rotator, the other is a lateral rotator. If one's an adductor, the other is an abductor. They're always opposites. So the proper way to use Sherrington's law and the law of reciprocal inhibition is you elongate the anterior muscles first, and then you strengthen concentrically the posterior muscles. And from a neurological perspective, you always want to finish with an extension type of movement. Your brain will remember the last input that's put in. So you want it to remember a posterior movement to keep the shoulders back. Okay, that's a little clinical gem for you. In terms of isometric, isometric is when there's tension, however, the tension never exceeds the resistance so that there's no change in the joint angle, like pushing up against the wall, pushing against a parked car, right? You could feel tension in your body, you have contraction, but there's no change in any joint angle. So that would be, in this case, over to the right, holding the book out in the stationary position. You have the shoulder flexors that are engaging and the elbow flexors and wrist flexors and finger flexors, but there's no change in the joint angle or no movement, okay? All right, a few other terms I think is important to know. Origins and insertions. Origins are usually the part of the muscle that is more proximal, whereas the insertion is the part of the muscle that's more distal. Also, proximals are usually the stationary part, whereas the insertion is the movable part. So in the example where I gave you before, the biceps, we know the biceps flex the elbow. The origin was here, it stayed still. The insertion is on the radial tuberosity, the radius flexed, right? So origin, insertion. Agonist, antagonist, you heard me talk about agonist and antagonist just before. An agonist is the primary mover or the main mover that moves a, a muscle and provides motion. An antagonist is the one that opposes it. So in this particular instance on the left here, if the biceps is the agonist for elbow flexion, the antagonist would have to be on the posterior side, and that would be the triceps, the triceps brachii. Now, a synergist is a muscle that assists or does the same thing as the agonist. So in this instance here on the left, if the biceps brachii is the primary mover for elbow flexion, there are two other elbow flexors that you'll learn about, the brachialis and the brachioradialis. They would be synergistic. They're helpers in the process. Okay, so we know origins and insertions. We did agonist, synergist, antagonist. Innervation, when you hear the word innervation, when you look at it, right there in the middle, we see the word nerve. So innervation is that 
muscles do not contract without nerve supply going to them. When you do neurology, you will go over the brachial plexus of the neck, a little bit higher is the cervical plexus. Cervical plexus is from like C1 to C4. And then C5 to T1, nerve roots, is the brachial plexus. So from the neck, there's a group of nerves that go down the shoulder all the way down to the fingertips. In the lower back, that controls the entire lower extremity, from the gluteus maximus or the iliopsoas all the way down, that, all the way down to the toes, there's the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. Okay, so it's really important to make sure that the nerves from the neck are not being compressed, they're not being irritated, they're not being pinched, so that you have full force and full nerve supply going to your muscles. Okay. <clears throat> All right, skeletal muscle tissue. From a microscopic standpoint, when we look at muscles, we have muscle fibers or a muscle fiber cell. That's kind of like the smallest part. And what surrounds all of these muscle fibers is a layer called an endomysium, okay? An endomysium. When we have a bunch of these endomysiums together, you can group one of these, it's called a, a fascicle. And each fascicle around it is surrounded by a perimysium. Perimysium is going to go around one of these entire groups, and then another perimysium around another group, and another perimysium around another group. And then all those groups, each of these fascicles, are then surrounded by another layer all the way around called an epimysium, all the way around. Then you have uh, fascia which is this clear translucent layer that covers muscle and tendons. Fascia, if you um, are a carnivore and you've ever eaten chicken, uh, when the chicken is cooked, right, you can peel off the skin, right, and there's the derm epidermis and then there's the dermis, and then you see the meat. The meat is the muscle. And there's white meat and dark meat. We'll talk about the difference as to what makes meat white in this uh, lecture and what makes meat dark. There's different types of fibers. We'll call them fast twitch and slow twitch fibers or red twitch and white twitch fibers. We'll talk about the differences in a little bit. So uh, fascia is that layer that is superficial to the muscle, and if you peel it off, it's just a thin, translucent layer. Fascia is really important. It covers muscles, it covers tendons, it covers organs. There's a really neat science around fascia. And it also explains why when someone stubs their toe, they can get tension headache the next day. Or if someone is squinting all day because they're having trouble seeing, they can get foot or ankle pain. It's because of these fascial connections. There's actually fascia that goes from your eyebrow, right, from the frontalis, all the way the epicranius, down the posterior neck to the traps, down the spine to the lats, past the glutes to the hamstrings to the calf, all the way down underneath the foot to the toes. Now, when I did human dissection, when I was in school and dissected the human body, we didn't really study fascia too much. We just talked about where muscles originated and muscles inserted. But now there's like a new science about fascia and fascial connections and how fascia crisscrosses. It's amazing, but it does explain a lot of conditions musculoskeletal conditions about fascia. There are some good books out there called Fascial Trains that talk about this. But in this picture, you will see that the muscle attaches to the periosteum of the bone by way of tendons. So this is the contractile part. It transmits that force to the tendon. The tendon attaches to the bone and pulls the bone. If 
the contraction is so forceful, sometimes the tendon can tear off the bone. That's a problem. Okay. One of the most common tendon ruptures in the body occurs down at the ankle, at the Achilles tendon. And when that ruptures, the gastrocnemius in the calf balls up to the top. It kind of creates a little ball. Same thing with the biceps. Some people tear the biceps tendon. They can still flex the arm, but it's weaker because the biceps tore. And then again, you'll see the biceps ball up. Here's another view showing the skeletal muscle. And then we have the endomysium around it. Then we have a fascicle and you have a bunch of fascicles and each fascicle is surrounded by a, a perimysium. And then all the way around the muscle is the epimysium. And then again, you have the tendon. This is what it looks like when you're looking at, uh, you know, a cross section of it where you can see the endomysium way in here where those muscle fibers are. Then we see a perimysium going around one of these. And then we have the epimysium going around the entire thing. So skeletal muscle is made up of these individual muscle fiber cells, each muscle fiber surrounded by that connective tissue called endomysium, and then a group of 10 to 100 muscle fibers surrounded by the perimysium is called fascicle. And then a group of those fascicles are surrounded by connective tissue called an epimysium, and that's what's going to make up that entire skeletal muscle. The endomysium, the perimysium, and the epimysium, they're going to extend through the muscle. They're going to join together at the very ends, and they're going to form tendons. And again, one side of the tendon is the origin, and the other end is the insertion. Tendons are that inelastic connective tissue that's going to attach to the periosteum of the bone. There are some muscles that you're going to hear the term aponeurosis which is a tendon, it's just a broad, flat tendon. So when you learn about the biceps tendon, the insertion is called a bicipital aponeurosis. When you learn about the latissimus dorsi, the widest muscle of the back, that's really a shoulder muscle, its origin is in the lower thoracics, all of the lumbars, a little bit of the sacrum, a little bit of the iliac crest of the pelvis, and it's called the thoracolumbar aponeurosis because it's a broad, flat tendon. Fascia, I mentioned uh, earlier, it describes that sheath of fibrous connective tissue that exists underneath the skin, but it surrounds all of your muscles, it even surrounds your organs, your blood vessels, and even, even nerves. So, where muscles attach to nerves, where they meet, we call it the neuromuscular junction. Muscles that are stimulated to contract by a nerve, the type of nerve that goes to a muscle is called a somatic motor neuron. These are voluntary. You have conscious control over it. A somatic motor neuron. If it's, an, if it's a sensory neuron, sensory brings information up and into the brain. It kind of ascends and goes up into the brain. Motor information starts in the brain and descends down out to the spine, out to the brachial plexus or the lumbar plexus or the sacral plexus and meets the muscle. Where the nerve and the muscle meet is called the NMJ or the neuromuscular junction. So let's take a look at the neuromuscular junction. If we look on the top left, here is an axon. If you remember back uh, when we talked about different types of uh, tissues, we said one of them was nerve. And if we used your hand, we said your fingers were the dendrites, the palm was the soma or the cell body, and then the forearm was the axon. And at the very, very end of axons, we had what was called the end bulbs or the axon terminal or synaptic end bulbs. So here on the top left is the axon, 
we could see that it's myelinated here. This is that cholesterol, that fat that insulates and protects the nerves. So this is the end of the axon, the somatic motor neuron, and it's going to attach to the muscle. The part of the muscle that it attaches to is called the motor end plate, the motor end plate. And at the very between the motor end plate and the end of the axon is where we have these synaptic end bulbs where we have neurotransmitters. The major neurotransmitter, the major, major neurotransmitter that is a major player in the game of muscle contractions, it's always excitatory, always, always excitatory at the neuromuscular junction is called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is abbreviated ACH. ACH stands for acetylcholine. Now, the acetylcholine is stored here at the very end, at the end bulb, at the synaptic end bulbs. They're just, those proteins are hanging out there and they're gonna be released through a method called exocytosis. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take this section right here, this section between the end of the axon and the motor end plate and the muscle, we're gonna blow that up and look at it over here to the right. So here's the axon. At the very end, the swollen tip right here, the peach color tip, is called a synaptic end bulb. And look what we have there. We have these synaptic vessels that contain ACH. What does ACH stand for? Acetylcholine. What else do we see lots of when we see nerve and when we see muscle? Mitochondria. Mitochondria are always found in parts of the body that are always working. Nerves are always working. Muscles are always working. Now, in order for the acetylcholine to be released, there's got to be a message or a chemical that tells it to release itself. That which initiates that is this mineral right here called calcium. So calcium drives itself in. Calcium comes in. You see you've got this calcium channel right here. Calcium comes in to the axon terminal where that synaptic end bulb is and says, okay, neurotransmitter, tag, you're it. And this acetylcholine neurotransmitter is now released. These synaptic vesicles move to the very end. We see one here, we see one here here, here, and here. They're moving to the very end of the axon and they are releasing the acetylcholine into this space, into this gap. This gap is called a synaptic cleft. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this box right here, which has the end of the axon, the synaptic cleft, and the end plate of the muscle, we're going to take this box, blow it up, and now we're looking at it here. So here, this is the synaptic vessel that is opening up, releasing acetylcholine from the synaptic vessel into this cleft called synaptic cleft. We see it here, right? You see calcium came in, stimulated this, tag your it, it's going to release the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Well, what is the acetylcholine going to do? Well, that's a good question. The acetylcholine, we can see, binds to these green channels. These green channels are sodium channels. Notice the doors are closed until the acetylcholine binds to it and then it's open, says me, right? Now we see that the acetylcholine binds to this acetylcholine receptor. Look what rushes in, Na. Na comes from the word natrium, N-A-T-R-I-U-M. When you take the first two letters of natrium, 
that is Na, which is sodium, right? Like sodium chloride, NaCl, sodium chloride, Na plus Cl minus, sodium chloride. So when sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out. That's that sodium potassium pump that you learned about earlier on. Sodium rushes in, rushing in is involved in creating an action potential or a nerve impulse, if you would. So for our purposes, depolarization, activation, nerve stimulation are all interchangeable. So let's review. We have the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. What's telling it to be released? Calcium. The acetylcholine exits through exocytosis. It's now hanging out in the synaptic cleft, and it's trying to find a place to bind to. It finds the acetylcholine receptor here, 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 all these green ones. It opens up and allows sodium to flow through. Now, sodium flows through. This right here, this right here is called a T tubule. It's called a transverse tubule. That's going to be important. I'm going to show you in a second. But this sodium rushing in is going to create an action potential, nerve stimulation. Okay. This is what a neuromuscular junction looks like. You can see here is the somatic motor neuron. These are different uh, axon collaterals. Here's an axon collateral here, here. These are all different collaterals off the axon. At the very end of the axon collateral are the synaptic end bulbs. This would be uh, like the motor end plate. Okay, the motor end plate is where the axon is going to make contact with the muscle itself. So here's a muscle, and here's some terminology I want you to become familiar with. So here's the T-tubule. Remember I said the action potential goes down the T-tubule? The T in T-tubule stands for transverse because this tubule runs transversely to everything else that's running horizontally, right? So what's making contact with this transverse tubule is this meshwork of these blue vessels. These blue mesh-like network of vessels is referred to as the sarcoplasmic reticulum sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum has a really important function. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to store a really important mineral. What mineral is the sarcoplasmic reticulum going to store? Calcium. It's going to store calcium. Haven't you heard somewhere in the back of your mind, you know that calcium is involved with muscle contraction. So we're just explaining how it is involved. And you're going to know a little bit more when we get into more of the physiology. So we've got a transverse tubule. We have a sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the action potential is going to drive down this transverse tubule, transmit it to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to release something that it stores. What mineral does it store? Calcium. When it releases the calcium, it's going to rain that calcium all through these myofibrils, the sarcomere. The sarcomere are these dark and light filaments that we see deep here. It's made up of actin and myosin filaments. Okay, so we have the transverse tubule, sarcoplasmic reticulum butting up right against it. They call this a triad, where you have the T-tubule and then two ends two ends of the uh, transverse tubule butting up against it, 
one, two, three, they call that the triad. Look at all the mitochondria. Here's a mitochondria here, 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 here. Lots of mitochondria. Mitochondria creates ATP as long as you breathe in oxygen and you breathe out CO2, which is the byproduct of energy production. We'll talk about shortly ATP production that takes place in the mitochondria and some of the main processes involved. So what we have is a neuron up here on the top left. There's a motor neuron, a somatic motor neuron. These are the dendrites, the points. This is the cell body. Here is the axon. Here's the path of the action potential. The axon is myelinated. That's the cholesterol and fatty insulation that protects. At the very end is the axon terminal where these synaptic, end uh, synaptic terminals or end bulbs meet the muscle is called a motor end plate. Now let's take this box right here and we're going to blow this up and now we have this right here. Here is the synaptic terminal. You can see a mitochondria here. You can see that you've got some sort of vessel with a neurotransmitter. We know that the neurotransmitter is always ACH, acetylcholine. So calcium has to come in and tell that to release itself. And then that neurotransmitter hangs out on the synaptic cleft. So here, on the top right is the axon. These are the neurotransmitters. We see acetylcholine is in the synaptic cleft. It binds to the motor end plate. It's going to bind to the acetylcholine receptor. It says, open says me. Sodium rushes in. When sodium rushes in, it creates the excitation, the action potential, the nerve impulse. And we said it goes down the T tubule, the transverse tubule, because this runs transversely to everything else. So this transverse tubule is going to butt up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. Calcium is released. You see it? it looks like it's rain or snowing calcium and it's going to have an effect on this structure called a sarcomere. The sarcomere is made up of thin filaments called actin and then filaments in the middle called myosin. And notice myosin has these little heads coming off them called myosin heads. When Myosin heads interact with actin, creates the sliding filament theory of a shortening phase contraction, and the muscle fiber contracts, producing tension. The contractile proteins are myosin and actin. Myosin, actin is the thin one. Myosin is the thicker filament. So here on the right, we have actin, and here is myosin. Notice the myosin has these myosin heads. I also want you to look at actin, and you'll see that actin over here, you can see that it has these like targets on it, like these black circles. You can't see all of them because the circles are somewhat covered by this string. There's another string up here that's covering them, right? These are different type of proteins called regulatory proteins. The string that goes around this way is called tropomyosin. And what's holding that string in place are these blue ones called troponin. So think of the string being held down by a staple called troponin. And it's covering, it's covering these black binding sites, right? It's called a binding site, and it's covered by tropomyosin. Now, 
what I'm going to tell you here is that as long as the tropiacin is covering the binding site, myosin and these myosin heads have no place to attach, create a contraction. The only time a muscle contraction takes place is if the myosin heads, see right there, it's got a little circular tip. It says actin binding site. So this part is looking for this part. It's like the male part is trying to find the female part. But it can't find it because this is covered by tropomyosin. And remember, troponin is covering it. So when do they meet? When does the myosin head actually contact the binding site on actin. What has to happen is that something has to remove staple. Something has to remove troponin, which is referred to as the staple. And if the staples are removed by a staple remover, tropomyosin is not stable anymore and it moves, it translocates, it shifts. And when tropomyosin shifts, what becomes exposed are these binding sites, actin. They become open. When they become open and available, myosin head can make contact with it and make a muscle contract. It's kind of like it's kind of like me gripping onto a rope, right? My hands are, and my Fingers are the mice and heads, and the rope is a place for me to contact. And then I can pull, and then I can release, I can grab again on the rope and pull. But the rope has to be available, it has to be a space for me to grab onto. Think of it that way. Okay? Now, what do you think is the staple remover? What is going to come in that's going to remove troponin? It's going to be this the calcium that's being released, right? So the action potential comes down, hits the sarcoplasma reticulum, calcium is released into the sarcomere, which is actin and myosin, the myosin heads. When calcium comes in, calcium is going to remove the troponin so that the tropomyosin, the ropes or those strips can move, and now you've got myosin heads that can attach. Okay, I'm going to go through this again in a second. So you have contractile proteins, regulatory proteins. Uh, the regulatory proteins are like on and off switch. Think of it that way. These are the structural proteins that help to keep muscle together. Um, they all have unique function. Dystrophin is interesting because when there's an autoimmune condition against dystrophin, this is where you get muscular dystrophy, muscular dystrophy. So myofibrils are composed of those muscle filaments. Some are thin or thick. Those are the actin and myosin. Those are basic contractile unit called the sarcomere. The sarcomere is composed of three things, the regulatory proteins, the contract proteins, and the structural proteins. Regulatory proteins are tropomyosin and troponin that are on and off switch. Troponin was the staple. Tropomyosin was the rope or the string just covering the binding site. The contractile proteins are actin and myosin. Actin is thin, myosin is thicker, that has myosin heads. And the structural proteins are titan, dystrophin, nebulin, connectin, myomedin. These are done with alignment stabilization, extensibility, and elasticity of muscle. When we look at actin, actin itself, which is the thin filament, it's going to have F and G proteins. It's going to have tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin, we said, was that rope, right? It's that molecule that extends the entire length of actin, and it's going to cover the binding sites. Troponin holds the tropomyosin over the binding site on the G proteins. The G proteins or G molecules are going to be each of these. 
right? Each of these purple round spheres is a G molecule. The entire thing is an F strand. Okay. So F and G. The G is where the binding site is. So G molecule. Each of these is a binding site. Each of these is a binding site. Okay. Now, can expose the binding site when calcium released. So basically, calcium is the key to this lock. Calcium is the main thing here that is involved in saying, okay, Trojan, you're the people, I'm going to move you. Tropomycin shifts, and then myosin finds the binding site. So here, in this picture, once again, you can see the purple strands. You see the little target sign on each, which is darker purple. That's the binding site. Notice it's not completely visible or available because this strand called tropomycin is covering it. In this picture, the yellow is the trope. That's the staple. So when Calcium comes in here. Remember, calcium was stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum when it's released. It's going to remove troponin so that the tropomyosin shifts and now the binding site becomes available. That happens, you get these myosin heads that are going to interact and create a cross bridge between the myosin and the actin. And look at all the heads. Myosin has so many different heads on. We're just showing one right here. So if we look here on the top right again, you have G molecules, which are the round balls, round spheres. That there's a binding site or an active site. In this case, it's yellow. But it's yellow, and we see that the tropomyosin is blocking it. And we see troponin holding it in place. Calcium removes troponin, tropomyosin shifts, the binding sites become available. And then look down at the bottom where you look at the myosin and the myosin head. I like to think again, remember how I use the arm and the forearm as an example of a neuron? We're going to do the same thing. And we're going to say that the arm is a myosin. And myosin has two hinges. Okay? It's going to have a hinge here and then a hinge here. So the this bends first. And then the myosin head grabs onto the binding site on actin. And when it binds to actin, this hinge bends and creates a slide. So down here, we kind of see two hinges. There's one here, and there's one here. This is the myosin head. You could see the actin is red, and the myosin is kind of like bluish purple. You can see all these myosin heads. When they can make contact, this H zone right here, is going to get much smaller, like it is here. On the top, you see the sarcomere is at rest, but down here below is contraction. And look what happened to the H zone, this space here in the middle. It just got shorter. So let's look at the steps in order. Right? So we have a motor neuron, it's contacting the motor end plate. This is on the muscle, muscle membrane. Here's the synaptic terminal. The synaptic terminal contains these neurotransmitters in the synaptic vessel. Calcium rushed in, told the neurotransmitter to release. 
the name of the neurotransmitter is ACH, acetylcholine. It's going to bind to the receptor on the, on the membrane of the muscle, motor end plate. When acetylcholine hits the receptor, sodium rushes in. Sodium rushes in. It's going to create an action potential or excitation down the T-tubule, which stands for transverse tubule. The action potential butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, stores calcium. Calcium is released. It's going to interact with actin and myosin. It's going to remove troponin. So tropomyosin shifts. And when the binding site becomes available, one hinge, two hinges, right? It makes contact with actin. <clears throat> when it makes contact, the contraction begins, and the H zone here is going to get smaller because the two sides come together. And the contraction happens. Now, how do we stop the contraction? Right? So on the left are the steps that initiate the contraction. How do we end the contraction? Well, we got to remove the neurotransmitter. So the acetylcholine is removed by acetylcholine esterase. Anything that ends in ASC, anything that ends in ACE, is an enzyme. So acetylcholine is removed by acetylcholine esterase. When that happens, there's nothing, there's no chemical messenger anymore. So all the calcium that was released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum can be recaptured and put back where it belongs, back in the sarcoplasmic reticulum for storage. If there's no calcium, if there's no calcium stimulating the sarcomere, then it can't remove the troponin. So that means tropomyosin is blocking the binding sites. So the active sites are covered once again, or the binding sites are covered, and there's no more cross-bridge interaction, and the contraction ends, and muscle goes back to its relaxing place. So the steps that initiate contraction at the neuromuscular junction, or the NMJ, acetylcholine is released by the synaptic terminal, Right, it's going to bind to the receptor, the acetylcholine receptor on the sarcolemma. The resulting change in the transmembrane potential of muscle fiber leads to production of an action potential. It's going to go down the T-tubule. The T-tubule bumps up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's going to release calcium. The calcium is going to interact with the sarcomere. That calcium is going to remove the troponin. So the tropomyosin complex shifts, and then the binding sites become exposed. And that's going to create a cross bridge between myosin heads and the actin. The contraction begins as these repeated cycles of cross bridge binds. They pivot, and then they detach. But the detachment, in order to release the myosin head, we need energy. We need ATP, not for the contraction part. We need ATP for the releasing part. And then the muscle goes back to its relaxing state. So we need energy and ATP for the myosin heads to release. And we know that's true because if you ever watch like CSI or any of these police shows and they find a, a body, Sometimes the body is in like a shortened, contracted state. They call it rigor mortis because it's in the shortened, contracted state. Well, why can't they release it? Well, in the early stage of death, they can't release it because they're not alive. They're not generating ATP anymore, so the myosin heads can't detach. Now, over time, there are a lot of proteases and degradatory digestive enzymes that release that break down all proteins. So it's, they can kind of tell time of death depending on all that. All right, so that creates the contraction. And then the action potential 
ceases and acetylcholine is broken down by acetylcholine esterase. That's the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Now the calcium is reabsorbed by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's what SR stands for. When the calcium ion concentrations approach normal resting levels, the troponin, tropomyosin complex returns to its normal position and the binding sites are then covered. So there's no more cross bridge and the muscle relaxes. So what are the events? What's involved with that neuromuscular junction? We have these voltage gated calcium channels in the synaptic end bulb, which results in an influx of calcium. When the calcium comes in, it tells the neurotransmitter acetylcholine to be released by a method called exocytosis into that synaptic cleft, right? The neurotransmitter binds to that channel. The channel opens, happens to be a sodium channel. Sodium influxes, it rushes in. That's gonna depolarize. It's gonna go down, the action potential goes down the transverse tubule. And then the T-tubule butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's going to release the calcium. And then after the contraction, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine gets broken down by acetylcholine esterase. That's a good little review. So the myosin pulls on the actin, and it causes that thin filament to slide inwards. Thanks to the structural proteins, there is a transmission of that force throughout the entire muscle, resulting in a whole muscle contraction. Nebulin, dystrophin, right, all of those structural um, proteins. Now, what we see here, if we look at A and B, we see that calcium already came in. It removed troponin and tropomyosin shifted. So we can see the binding sites here on actin are open. So what happened? The myosin head sprung up and attached. But what do we see here at the end of the myosin? Look at that, we see ADP and P. ADP is adenosine diphosphate. That's two phosphates. If it's AMP, AMP is adenosine monophosphate. That means it's adenosine with one phosphate attached. ADP is adenosine with two phosphates attached. ATP is adenosine with three phosphates attached. So here is ADP and another phosphate hanging out. Now that other phosphate hanging out, sometimes you call it CP, which is creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate. So phosphate just doesn't hang out by itself it attaches to creatine. When, phosph when this ADP, two phosphates, and this creatine phosphate join forces, you get ATP, right? You get another phosphate attached. So after this happens, after the attachment takes place, now a power stroke happens, right? One hinge, happened first, right? The elbow part bent up and it made contact. Then this hinge bends. So what we see up here is after the elbow joint bent up and made contact, now the wrist joint bends and flings the actin inward. Now that's like me grabbing a rope and I pull in. How do I pull again? I got to release grab the rope and pull in again. So what did I say is needed in order for the myosin heads to be released? We need ATP. So right here, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and creatine phosphate, or phosphate is released. They join forces, and now we have ATP. That's energy. It takes energy for the myosin head to release. And then after it releases and it detaches, it can go back to its resting state. You're back to ADP and CP again. Okay. 
So how do muscles derive the ATP necessary to contract or create a, a, a muscle contraction? We need CP, creatine phosphate. We need anaerobic glycolysis. I'll explain what that is. Glyco is sugar. It's like gluco. Glyco is sugar. And lysis means to break down. Glycolysis is breaking down sugar. And we, we need cellular respiration. CP, creatine phosphate. Now, there is an enzyme that's called creatinine kinase or CPK, creatinine phosphokinase. Kinase. It's going to catalyze the transfer of a phosphate group from CP to ADP. So right here, let's, let's look here first. We have ATP on the top left. ATP can be broken down into adenosine diphosphate. You can go from three phosphates to two by donating one of the phosphates here to CP, to creatine phosphate. So now you have CP, creatine phosphate. Now, creatine phosphate can donate this phosphate to ADP. When these two join forces, you get ATP again, adenosine triphosphate. And then what you're left with is not creatine phosphate, but just creatine. Creatine can hook up with ATP, borrow one of these phosphates, and give us ADP. All right, so you have this cycle that continuously moves, continuously. So at rest, a muscle produces a lot more ATP than we need. So the ATP can transfer some of that energy and store it with creatine, which is what we have here. We got too much ATP, we don't need it. So we're gonna store some of these phosphates hooked up to creatine for immediate, fast burst of energy. You need to do a quick power lift, a quick burst of energy, boom, creatine phosphate to the rescue. ATP plus creatine, right? ATP plus creatine, this creatine is gonna take that phosphate and now you get ADP plus creatine phosphate. And the enzyme that we use for that is creatine phosphokinase. Okay, creatine phosphokinase, that's what's used. Now, creatine phosphokinase is found in muscle cells. So if a, it's an enzyme that's found in here, right? Kinase, anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. So if this is a muscle cell and this, this is a heart muscle cell and this muscle cell dies and the membrane opens up, C CPK can escape and it's released into the bloodstream and CPK levels may rise. That's indicative of a heart attack, right? So CPK can cross the cell membrane is released into the bloodstream whenever there's muscle damage. That's important to know. So, Here's the mitochondria here off to the right. And outside of, the, outside of the mitochondria is the cytosol, right? So mitochondria is one of the organelles, part of a cell. There's cytosol in here, right? The whole cytoplasm. So in the cytosol is where glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, can be broken down into pyruvic acid, which is really two, three carbon sugars. Okay, if we take, if we take, let me see if I can show you on a screen share real, real quick. Let me just go to a my whiteboard for a second. Okay. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a six carbon sugar, 
glucose. If I break this bond and I break this bond, what I'm left with is two, three carbon sugars. That's glycolysis right there. What we did is we just broke this down and what we're left with is this and this, which is this and this. On the left was glucose, on the right is pyruvic or pyruvate, okay? So let's go back here. So now we have glucose that is broken down into pyruvic acid. Where does this take place? This process is called glycolysis. Lysis means to break down. What are we breaking down? Glucose into what? Pyruvic acid. This glycolysis takes place in the cytosol or in the cytoplasm. Once we get the pyruvic acid and you have oxygen that's available, you're not out of breath, you're nice and relaxed, you have plenty, you're just cool and collected. When you're in that state, pyruvic acid can enter the mitochondria. As long as you have B1, B2, B3, lipoic acid, the Krebs cycle works to make some energy, ATP. But it makes a lot of coenzymes. What the Krebs cycle is, is releasing is enzymes. These enzymes that the Krebs cycle produces is used for the electron transport chain, which is where the majority, it's where the majority of your ATP is produced. Do you make some energy with glycolysis? Yes, very little. Do you make some energy with the Krebs cycle? Yes, but it's really the precursor because the coenzymes, the coenzymes NAD and FAD that are produced by the Krebs cycle are used in the electron transport chain. And the other thing that's really important that's used in the electron transport chain is iron and CoQ10. Iron and coenzyme Q10. Think of what happens to women during that time of month. When a woman is menstruating and she's losing blood, you're losing iron, hemoglobin. Heme, globin. Heme has an iron containing portion. Your energy may not be that good. What happens if you're iron deficient anemia? What if you're anemic due to lack of iron? You have no energy. Well, now you know why. Because that iron is needed by the mitochondria to help produce ATP. CoQ10 is needed also. And I'm going to show you what happens because there's a percentage of the population that takes cholesterol medication. Probably 20 to 25% of the population is taking cholesterol medication. I want to show you one of the things to be aware of if you have a family member that's taking um, Lipitor, Crestor, any type of statin, even if they're taking more of a holistic approach using red yeast rice, which is the same thing as a statin. Um, you have to be careful because it depletes coenzyme Q10. And if you're depleted of CoQ10, you have a challenge making energy. Now think of where all the mitochondria are. Brain, muscles. So muscles hurt, fibromyalgia. Brain doesn't function as well. Cognitive dementia. Right? And that's one of the black box warnings on these statins is myalgia, which is my is muscle. Algia means pain, muscle pain, joint pain, arthralgia, and dementia-like symptoms. You have to be really, really careful with that. So in the mitochondria is where the Krebs cycle and the ETC or electron transport chain take place. ETC needs iron, needs CoQ10, you make lots of ATP. The Krebs cycle needs your B vitamins, B1, 2, 3 for energy, B1, 2, 3 for energy. 
glycolysis is the initial step, right? To get glucose into pyruvate, pyruvate or pyruvic acid must happen first. When the presence of oxygen, pyruvic acid can now enter the mitochondria to start the Krebs cycle. If you're out of breath and you're huffing and you're puffing and you don't, you're in an oxygen debt, pyruvic acid does not enter the mitochondria. Pyruvic acid becomes another type of sugar called lactic acid. Lactic acid. Lactic acid used to be known as the thing that causes the burn in muscles, and that's not entirely true. It's kind of a myth, but it's involved in the process. It's involved, but it's not due to lactic acid. It's just associated with it. But lactic acid builds up and it gives you this time while your muscles are sore and burning to kind of pause, take a deep breath, catch your breath, get oxygen levels to build up so you're not in an oxygen debt. And then lactic acid goes to the liver and can be converted back to pyruvic acid. And then pyruvic acid can enter the mitochondria and now you have energy production again. And now you can exercise once again. So I promised I was going to tell you about cholesterol and what statins do and how they can harm CoQ10. Cholesterol synthesis goes through this pathway. And you don't have to memorize this pathway. This is more like FYI to be able to understand what's happening to some family members and friends or future patients when you, when you get there into the healthcare field is that Acetyl-CoA gets converted to HMG-CoA. And HMG-CoA is supposed to be converted to mevalinate, but we need an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. Statins block that HMG-CoA reductase so that you can't go down this pathway to make cholesterol. Now, it just so happens if you can't make cholesterol, and we need cholesterol for hormones like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, they're all sterols, right? We need cholesterol to make them. And we don't make CoQ10, which is really important for energy production, and it's a really important coenzyme. I've had patients over the years die as a result of this from heart failure. They were taking statins. They took CoQ10. They did wonderful. Energy came back. They did great. They stopped the CoQ10 back in the hospital, heart malfunctions. They come out of the hospital. They're reminded to take the coenzyme Q10. The mitochondria have enough energy to make fuel, to make the mitochondria, to make the cardiomyocytes function again the way they should. Fantastic. So if you have patients or family members on a statin, they primarily take statins in the evening because the liver makes cholesterol at night, you want to make sure that they're taking coenzyme Q10. I take it, and I'm not on a anti, any anti-lipidemic anti meds. But when I'm exercising and biking and I want a little bit more energy, I use the CoQ10. Okay. When creatine phosphate stores are depleted, glucose is converted into pyruvic acid to generate ATP. So we have glycogen. Remember, anything that ends in ogen is an inactive something. It's inactive. Anything that ends in ogen means it's inactive. So when you have glucose in high concentrations, it's toxic, right? You can cause diabetes. So the body has a unique way of making it safe. It puts it into storage called glycogen. And it can store it in the liver. And it can store glycogen in muscles. Those are the two places glycogen is stored, liver and muscle. When the body needs it, glycogen is broken down into glucose. Now, glucose in the cytoplasm is broken down into pyruvic acid. We said it can make some ATP. That's called glycolysis. That doesn't happen in the mitochondria. It happens in the cytosol. Now, pyruvic acid, 
when you're anaerobic, when there's no oxygen available, we said pyruvic acid is converted into lactic acid. And it doesn't enter the mitochondria for fuel. It's going to go to the liver for the quarry cycle to get recycled. Under aerobic conditions, pyruvic acid can enter the mitochondria and undergoes a series of oxygen requiring reactions to generate ATP. So you've got pyruvic acid from glycolysis that can enter the mitochondria for the Krebs cycle. Fats can be broken down, right? Your triglycerides can be broken down for energy. Your protein is broken down into amino acids that can provide energy. We need oxygen. And then you get lots of ATP, especially from the electron transport chain. Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain take place in the mitochondria. Glycolysis takes place in the cytosol. The Cori cycle is what you heard me mention before. That's going to convert lactate back to pyruvate, right? It's the removal of the recycling of lactic acid by the liver. So let me show you. So on the left is liver, on the right is muscle. So in the muscle, glucose can be broken down into pyruvic acid. We said that's glycolysis. Now, if you don't have enough oxygen available, pyruvate is converted to lactate or lactic acid through this enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. So lactate is shuttled over through the blood into the liver, where at the liver, the same enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase, acts on lactate, converts it back to pyruvate, and pyruvate can become glucose. When you're making glucose, that's called gluconeogenesis, making new glucose from pyruvate. And then glucose can move from the liver into the muscle, and you can go through that whole cycle again. That's the Cori cycle, okay? The faster you can do this, the better your athletic abilities, okay? So you need a good, healthy liver to do that. Um, what can help to power con muscle contractions? We need growth hormone. That's why it's important to get your sleep. It's also important. Um, for testosterone, testosterone makes muscles a little bit thicker. Your thyroid hormones control your metabolism, control the energy to power contractions. Epinephrine, which is part of your sympathetic nervous system, is involved in powering contractions. When muscle fatigue kicks in, what's the onset of it? Well, maybe there's the inadequate release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Maybe it's depletion of creatine phosphate. Maybe you don't have enough oxygen. Maybe you don't have enough B1, B2, B3, iron, CoQ10. Maybe you don't have enough nutrients. Maybe there's the buildup of lactic acid in ADP. Or maybe you don't have enough acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Lots of things can create fatigue. So what do you have to do to rest what do you have to do to regain yourself after exercise right why do you continue to breathe <sighs> very heavy right for a while when you're exercising just try and pay back your oxygen then the oxygen level is needed the extra oxygen is going to go to replenishing the creatine phosphate stores it's going to go back to converting lactate back to pyruvate. So you can back, go back to glucose and get any ATP again. And it's going to reload oxygen onto myoglobin. Myoglobin. What controls muscle tension? The strength of muscle tension contraction depends on motor units that are activated. A motor unit consists of a somatic motor neuron. At the muscle fiber, it innervates. Activating only a few motor units are going to create a weak contraction. Activating many will generally result in a very strong contraction. So right here is a motor unit, right? Motor unit recruitment is the process in which a number of active motor unit increases. 
weaker motor units are recruited first, then it's followed by stronger motor units. Motor units contract alternately to sustain a contraction for a longer period of time so that you don't fatigue. Even when at rest, a skeletal muscle always exhibits some degree of tension, and we call that tone. Let's do a quick thing here. Let me uh, stop this recording here, and then I'm going to continue with this um, myoglobin and skeletal muscle contraction. Give me one second. <clears throat> 